Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and we are continuing our 100% reusable space program, and we are on to basically adding more fuel tanks. We have space for six, but I only added three, and yeah, every time you dock, you have to be careful you don't leave the SAS on, because the whole station will oscillate and wobble like a giant jellyfish in space. Also note that because docking is now so slow and the frame rates are around 5 frames per second that almost all the docking you see from now on will be at double speed simply because uh, it looks a whole lot nicer. So yeah, I'm double speeding this in the in the post-production, let's say. So yeah, that's us get three tanks. We're going to do a little bit of housekeeping because I don't really need that... Um, the little space tug up the back, moving it down and taking the opportunity to take a look at how beautiful this ginormous construction is in space. You see we're coming, we're going to bring down towards the back of the docking array. There's not much room for ships there so it's a perfect place to hang things like these little tugs and space probes and other things that don't, you know, have huge amounts of mass. They have to kind of slide in there between the solar panels and other things. And yes, one other thing I realized is that the limited crew we have up there currently have no way to return should there be a major emergency. So I built this nice space uh, escape pod system. There's basically five of them kind of budded around this little thing. And it, it's very obvious now that I'm watching this at two times speed that I let this thing start drifting towards the station. But it wasn't obvious at the time when I was watching it at 5 frames per second. So I'm just, you know, presuming that everything's okay and not realizing that that um, entire spacecraft is in fact on a collision course with my very fancy solar panels. Meanwhile, the crew does his thing. He, he's going to have to do the docking. So he'll jump into one of the escape pods and fly the entire node using the RCS system. Now, they are, the RCS system isn't generally going to be used for an escape, uh, but it's a possibility, I guess, if you, will have, if you want to detach the whole block of five at once. Obviously, you have to make sure everyone's on board before then. But you can see they also have sepatrons and parachutes, the idea being that we will use these to deorbit our spacecraft and get ourselves back and look how close I'm coming to those pa those solar panels. I think about now maybe I start to realize, uh-oh. <laughs> like it's coming in there like, oh, wait, panic, panic. I remember trying to figure out, uh, turning on the RCS and then switching through to chase cam to make sure I didn't fire in the wrong direction. I only just got it, I think. Uh, you can see how close I was to smashing into my own solar panels. Such is the are the perils of space travel, eh? <laughs> Meanwhile, the other dude's just kind of floating around. It doesn't matter if he bumps into the station. There's nothing there for him to bump into. So yeah, he's, we're going to try and hang these on to the side of the crew capsule. Now, this one's going to be slightly difficult, more difficult to dock because the the docking ports aren't aligned with the north-south axis, so it's going to be docking via eyeball. And again, just remember this is double speed, uh, twice as fast, so that you can actually get an idea of, of what the real speed would look like, let's say. You can see the clock ticking away in the top left. Um, it just looks a whole lot smoother when you do it double time, let's say. So we've just tr got it into chase mode, and we're going to try and eyeball where those docking ports actually are. And I have no idea what I'm doing right now, just floating around in ecstasy. Please don't stop me now. Uh, there we go, setting myself up. Now I shall wander in. Again, you know, this is one of these times where I point out, yeah, it'd be really nice to have some sort of designator on the the nav ball that shows me the orientation of those docking ports on the target you know other if i don't you know this is the most obvious thing to stick on those docking ports actually it doesn't really have the room to put two of them uh there's those docking ports that were put there originally to kind of extend the crew quarters but we we can fit 10 people on this station so i don't know what other crew we're going to be putting up here. I, I don't think we're going to be assembling a space army in orbit, at least not just yet. Maybe when we start going to war over the, the Keithane reserves, who knows? 
<laughs> and yes, we will be uh, we will be proceeding to use Keithane in the future because it's going to be far easier to refill this station. Right now, those big orange fuel tanks are empty, and you're going to see the amount of effort that it takes to even partially fill these things. Um, so they're just coming in a few meters ago, a few meters to go get in there. Dock up there. I think that was a touch. That was a touch, but nope, it's confused. Don't wobble. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Excellent. Now we have our integrated emergency escape system. There's definitely not going to be room for a second one there. Maybe we should rotate this to get it a little straighter. Or maybe not. Um, we'll probably be able to put another five on the other side if necessary. I'm not sure what we'll do with those other docking ports. Yeah, this is us. Let's just realign this a little. I want to get them at a nice 45 degree angle so that there's just enough room to connect something else to that docking port in a tight situation. That's probably the place for the... It might be a good place to store the space tug, actually. Hang them off of there. Who knows? We're, we're going to figure out... I, you know, you can never have too many docking ports on a space station. You'll see that planning never really accounts for everything. There's always ideas you have at a later stage. That looks a whole lot better. And of course, these things don't come off with enough velocity to particularly threaten anything. They, they kind of float away, and when they're far enough away, we fire up the, the little separatrons to take them back. Anyway, we'll send our man back into the station, his job done. You see, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just robots taking over here. The space tug doesn't do all the hard work. Sometimes we actually have to have the astronauts fly things manually. That's what they're there for, you know. Construction workers living life on the edge of space. So now, yes, refueling time. All we've done is we stick some extra fuel tanks on the top here. And it is a long and tedious operation because well, I think we're watching this at times eight. Um, we've got all the way into space and I think we have less than maybe a third of those tanks. Maybe we have about a third of one of those orange tanks. So it's going to take several launches to put enough fuel in them to be useful. Although technically we don't need a huge amount of fuel right now because we're really only looking at the moon as our next destination. But if we start looking at other um, other planets, then we're definitely going to need to start filling up all those fuel things. That's why I think I'm going to go for the, the Keithane mining op option here. Obviously very dark, we're on the black side of the planet here, the far side, and we're going to bring ourselves around now. You know, you notice that this one, we actually have a... We, we haven't been using the jet fuel tanks for a lot of these launches, and we've been returning with very oxidizer-rich uh, loads. It, it's just kind of annoying that there's only one fuel tank that can be used for jet fuel, and it has one form factor, and it doesn't quite fit into a lot of my designs right now. There's no obvious place for me to put this thing without really leading to a lot of you know, unbalanced spacecraft designs and things like that. But this one, yeah, we stick it at the front and that means that we draw fuel from that and our fuel ratios are much closer to what we're gonna, we're gonna need. Okay, there we go, we're gonna dock it at this end. I mean, we could dock it at any place, but this is the place we're putting it. Oh, uh, there might be a bit of a continuity error there, I realize, because I have moved the space tug again. I think I, think I might have done something in the meantime which I did not document. But never mind, you did get that wonderful beauty pass off the station, huh? Come on, dock, dock, very carefully. Just get in there. There we go. Okay, so now we're docked. Got to transfer that fuel over. You see that we have roughly uh, 2,000... I guess that's 10 tons of fuel. That's not so bad. 10 tons of fuel into low Kerbal orbit. Completely reusable. Unfortunately, it does mean that there will be a lot of this, and I'm not going to show you it all because it is going to be far too tedious. Hopefully in the future we can uh, basically improve our, our fuel sources so that we're not spending all that energy bringing up fuel from low, uh, from the carbon, from the planet carbon into a carbon orbit. That seems to take far too much time and energy and all these other things. This is why finding off-world fuel sources is such an advantage. Even in our reality, it's a big thing. If you, you've probably heard me mention Mars Direct. That's where they send a spacecraft in advance uh, with eight tons of hydrogen and then a bunch of solar cells and a chemical reactor. And while it's on Mars, 
it takes that hydrogen and combines it with the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to produce methane and liquid oxygen fuel for, um, well, for, for uh, returning. The idea being that you end up with like 100 tonnes of fuel for your 8 tonnes that you deliver. It all work. It's all a great idea. It'd be, you know, interesting if it actually happens. Anyway, uh, the return wasn't... I, I undershot quite a bit and ended up landing on the west coast off the continent. But uh, yeah, you see, we fire all the parachutes simultaneously and then we detach the extra fuel stage and they float down together into the ocean so that they may... Uh, be returned by uh, some unspecified technology, which, again, maybe will come in a future episode. Who knows? And here's the other one coming down. Look at that. Beautiful. 100% recovered. Everything looking good. Now we're just going to do that like six more times, huh? Repeat until bored, really, seriously. I'm going to have to come up with a different fuel source because <laughs> it will drive me mad. There we go. That is our entirety of our space program there. You see that? One space station in orbit and a couple of things on the surface. Now, we saw the escape pod thing. Um, we're just going to close out the video demonstrating how the escape pods actually work. I'm sure you can guess all this, but hey, you know, we all like to see uh, things firing and rockets going. So our astronaut is going to have to deftly maneuver himself across space into his little... Capsule, he can pick any one of these, the, well, yes, he can pick any one of these, assuming that he has the skill to actually hold onto a ladder. That's very good. Again, that was uh, being shot at double speed because, <laughs> because the, the, we would be getting five frames per second. There we go, so we detach, and once we're far enough away from the station, we make some adjustments to the staging so that the uh, we just hit space and the Sepatrons will fire. And then we just need to orient ourselves along the retrograde vector. And, you know, for extra stability, I found that if you rotate it, roll it on the, the roll axis, and then fire the engines, that keeps it nice and stable as opposed to other configurations, which will occasionally cause it to turn randomly left and right. And given that this is your one shot at returning without getting out and push, pushing, um, Getting out and pushing, never mind. <laughs> Given that's your one opportunity, you don't want to mess it up. So there, it shoots off at about 100 meters per second. That's more than enough to deorbit it very quickly. And uh, inside five minutes, we're in the atmosphere. By the time that a uh, 10 minutes rolls round, we're flying across the ocean to the the west of the Kerbal Space Center. Uh, not even that, not even that, the Kerbal's home continent in this case. And parachute deploys at about just past the 12 minute mark. You know, this is a relatively fast way to get home. Good to, good to do this kind of um, simulation testing because then we know exactly how much oxygen we need to have on these spacecraft. We don't need more than an hour of, of oxygen, right? So we could make them even lighter, hypothetically. I mean, you know, Bob, he can hold his breath if, if he overruns a little. And so as we descend back towards the planet, safe under our canopy of, of nylon or silk, um, we decide what to do next, and I think it is time that we should go for the moon. Build our space stations, build our space tugs, and we shall see you on the surface. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.